I began the work that ultimately led to the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction in 1950. Uh, I was a, a research student at, in a small MRC unit uh, with John Kendrew as my supervisor and Max Perutz being the head of the unit, and that was it, it was just three people. Um, I had been a, a student in physics, and my main interest had been in experimental particle physics. But after graduation, I decided to change field completely, joined this unit, and was in fact given complete freedom to choose my own particular subject of research. Now, during the first couple of years, I spent doing some work on hemoglobin and learning a bit of biology of which I was totally ignorant originally. Um, <coughs> and then I, I chose muscle as a possible topic because I'd found that although an awful lot was known about the um, mechanics and energetics and biochemistry of muscle, virtually nothing was known about its submicroscopic structure, nor about what actually happened during contraction. Now, one way of getting that information might be that if muscle was composed of regular repeating or semi-crystalline units of th these two structural proteins, then one might get evidence about what was happening from X-ray diffraction. However, people had looked at wide-angle X-ray diffraction, which showed you any changes in the polypeptide chain configuration and essentially it didn't, didn't show anything. And they also looked at dried muscle by low angle diffraction which showed you structural regularities the size of protein molecules, but that hadn't been informative either. However, I'd learnt that one had to keep protein crystals fully hydrated if you were going to get anything useful in an x-ray diagram from them. So I thought, well, maybe that would be true of muscle and maybe muscle really did contain lots of regular structures if only one could attack it the right way. And so for that purpose, I built a, a miniaturized x-ray camera, um, <coughs> which would uh, optimize the, the sensitivity of images collected on film. And I was also very fortunate that my supervisor, John Kendrew, knew a man called Bernal in London, who, in whose X-ray group two people were actually building a very fine focus, high intensity X-ray generator, X-ray tube, for another purpose. And they were kind enough to give me an early prototype of this, which formed an essential part of the x-ray setup that I built. I was very thrilled and relieved um, to see that I did in fact get quite a, a well-defined x-ray diagram. Not, not very detailed, but it consisted basically of two, two reflections, one here and then another one uh, a bit further out. And the spacing of these told one they came from a hexagonal arrangement uh, of objects and I concluded that this must be a hexagonal arrangement of myosin filaments. But what was particularly interesting was that in a muscle in Rigor, um, the pattern had the same spacing approximately, but the relative intensity of the two spots had, ch had changed and um, this told one that there was some alteration in the character of the lattice. And that, uh, in fact, you can get a projection of the electron density from those diagrams. This is a myosin filament here on my picture, and then this is a, another myosin filament there, and another one in the lattice over here. Um, <coughs> in between the myosin filaments is what I took to be actin filaments which appeared at low density in the relaxed muscle, but in rigor muscle, um, their density was much increased. Now I knew that 
actin and myosin tended to combine with ad, others in the absence of ATP, that's in the rigo muscle. So I concluded and it turned out I was correct that that was in fact what I was seeing, a, a double array of actin and myosin filaments interpenetrating with each other. <coughs> I could also see some reflections, axial reflections, which give you information about the longitudinal regularities along the length of the muscle. Uh, this is a, a spacing of about 145 angstroms. And there are another series of reflections not shown here. Um, the interesting, so it, it showed that the muscle was a sort of semi-crystalline structure at this, this, this scale. And these reflections didn't change in spacing when the muscle was passively stretched. Now, I made a mistake at that point. I thought that these probably, these reflections probably all came from the actin filaments. Uh, um, so I concluded the actin filaments didn't change in length, but I still had this picture that perhaps the myosin filaments somehow or other shortened down. Anyway, I finished my PhD and went to MIT into Smith's lab um, which was a, center, a new center for doing electron microscope work because I wanted to s make sure that these, this double array of filaments really existed. So by uh, fixing, embedding and sectioning a muscle, um, I was able to look at cross sections in the electron microscope and lo and behold one could see the double array of filaments very, very clearly. This was, this was a a rabbit muscle in rigor. This is a myosin filament, and that, that's another myosin filament. And then the actin filaments are in this little ring of six of them around each myosin center. So that, that was uh, very encouraging. And then, <coughs> shortly after this, early in 1953, Jean Hansen came to the same lab to learn electron microscopy too because she'd been studying uh, isolated myofibrils as seen in the light microscope, but she, she was a zoologist by training. And we decided, we were both doing the same thing essentially, we decided to combine our different approaches. And this worked out very successfully. Uh, one of the first experiments we did was to look at myofibrils in the light microscope on a, cover, on a slide with a cover slip over them uh, in the phase contrast microscope and you get very nice images of the A and I bands. I'll show you one in a moment. And um, when we irrigated these with solutions known to extract myosin from muscle, we found that the dense material uh, in the A band here was rapidly removed, leaving a sort of ghost fiber which consisted of the original Z lines and a segment of uh, filament which we concluded were probably actin. And we later found that applying actin uh, extraction procedures would remove this second set of, of filaments as well. Um, these are just showing the density plots before and after myosin extraction. So this was a sort of quite a revolutionary finding for us. And, but after a few hours, we sort of reoriented our way of thinking about things. And we realized that we were looking at two partially interpenetrating but overlapping arrays of myosin filaments and actin filaments, and that the cross sections I'd seen had been through the overlap region here. And <coughs> um, so that this is what I showed before, the overlap region. In the H zone, which where the actin filaments have, have stopped, you just see the thick filaments. And in the I bands, you can see the cross sections of the thin filaments. So we, <laughs> we then had a quite new model of the structure of a muscle and in between the two sets of filaments 
um, were these cross bridges that I'd uh, postulated must be there to enable the two sets of the actin and myosin filaments to interact with each other. Um, how, so we, we published a short paper on this in Nature, but at Schmidt's request, we omitted any speculation about how, it, how the system would actually work. But what we knew was that there were these two um, types of these two axial series of X-ray reflections, which didn't change during passive stretch. And so we thought, well, maybe they didn't change during contraction either. And that would mean that the two sets of filaments would themselves remain constant in length and that contraction would be achieved by the actin filaments sliding further in to the array of myosin filaments. And when we, after a lot of hard work, we were able to get sufficient images of muscle at different stages of contraction to prove that point. And <laughs> you can see this is a slightly stretched myofibril. Then we give it a little bit of ATP and it shortens down a little. Um, the I bands, the clearer regions, become shorter, the A bands stay constant in length. And as it shortens further still, the I bands get even shorter and ultimately they, they, they almost disappear. If we can also extract myosin uh, from a stretched fibril, and we can see the large gap between the ends of the actin filaments. But when on, of course, a different fibril, which is contracted, um, we can see this gap between the actins shortening down and then disappearing. So we can measure the length of the eye filaments and that was constant during contraction. So, <coughs> so this was written up for Nature and published in um, late May in 1954, along with another paper by Andrew Huxley, who's um, actually no relation of mine, and now Niedergerker, who had used a special interference microscope to look at intact fibers. And they'd found the same thing insofar as the A-band stayed constant in length, but um, they, the, their optics weren't such as you, you, to be able to see, the, measure the length of the actin filaments. So that, so that um, we thought was pretty strong evidence for the, this type of model, but um, it, it still remained quite controversial for a number of years, particularly because I think some of the other workers in the field hadn't sort of got used to this combination of X-rays and EM and phase microscopy. Um, but I think a few more people were probably convinced by some electron micrographs I was able to get two or three years later, uh, which showed the longitudinal sections through the myofiber, through a muscle fiber, in which you can see the thick filaments um, very clearly, I think, uh, stopping at the end of the A-band whereas the thin filaments continue on in, into the I bands out here. And you, you can also, at higher magnification, you can see these cross bridges between the actin and myosin filaments that uh, I'd suppose must be able to produce the relative sliding force that produces contraction. Are there any general conclusions about uh, how you go about a problem you can draw from this. Well, I'm not sure that there are, but I think I was very lucky because I had a clearly defined problem and I was able to find some new techniques uh, which provided a way into it. So if you can repeat that process, uh, you might get lucky like I did. Thank you.